Let's pick up in chapter 3. Chapter 3 is distinguishing between different types of apprehension. And we get, before we get to real and notional ascent, we get real and notional apprehension. I think I'd like to zero in on a paragraph on page 47. It makes a distinction here between different types of apprehension and different types of proposition. In fact, let me go even one paragraph further back. Here we have two modes of thought, both using the same words, having one origin, with nothing in common in their results. The informations of sense and sensation are the initial basis of both of them, but in the one we take hold of the objects from within them, in the other we view them from outside of them. We perpetuate them as images. In the one case, we transform them into notions in the other. So let's talk about the two kinds of, these two modes of thought. We have obviously here real apprehension and notional apprehension. They both uh, come, uh, the initial basis is sense and sensation from both. <coughs> the one takes hold of the objects from within, the other from outside. We perpetuate them as images in the one case, transform them into notions in the other. The natural and natural to us are both processes in their first elements and in their growth, however divergent and independent they are in their direction. They cannot really be inconsistent with each other, yet no one from the sight of a horse or dog would be able to anticipate its zoological definition nor from a knowledge of its definition to draw such a picture as would direct the eye to the living specimen. So we get again the idea here of the, the image and the concept, the definition. These will be compatible, but of different orders. We get the connection to the real thing. Perhaps a kind of realism in the, the real apprehension here. It seems something more ide in the ideal order and abstract. <clears throat> each use of the propositions has its own excellence and serviceableness, and each has its own imperfection. To apprehend notionally is to have breadth of mind, but to be shallow. Okay, we're in the parts of the outline here. So here, this is wide-angle focus, taking in many things, but not deeply. To apprehend really is to be deep, but to be narrow-minded. Tighter focus, more depth of the grasp of the thing apprehended. Again, the image, the memory, grasping of the real zebra, the zoological definition of we can have both of these, we can even move back and forth between them, but mastering this does not give me an impression of this, having this does not give me this besides. These are two different uses of proposition. These are both going to be based, founded ultimately in the senses, in information from the senses. We can see here, there's something going on here. We, we know Newman's identity, we know who he is, 19th century uh, Englishman. Um, so he's got this sort of empirical sort of DNA in his blood from the tradition of Hume and just sort of the general English um, orientation towards the world, which is skeptical of the sort of capital letter German nouns, things like reason or idea or being. I think he's got this sort of empiricist skepticism about trying to paint with too broad a brush too early in your philosophy. Right? Let's stay close to the date of experience. And also maybe a kind of realism as well, that, that there is this apprehension which is not the sort of Humean copy of you know, an idea, a copy of an impression, but is the actual presence of the real thing in the mind, a connection to the real in a way that is, is deep and still unites us, unites us to it or gives us access to it. He's insisting on the difference in kind between these two ways of apprehending a thing. Directly? No, that's not your hand up. Okay. Um, 
The latter is the conservative principle of knowledge. So over here, the former the principle of his advancement. As we hold on to things here, we advance knowledge here. So it's sort of a, it's a sort of speculative risk-taking advancement, perhaps on this side. Over here, this is what keeps us anchored down to the real so that we don't float away into the world of German idealism and you know, abstract nouns like capital S, substance, okay, in Spinoza's sense, or, or world spirit in the Hegelian sense. This is just my, my gloss on this. I think this is, we want to stay anchored in the real and yet be able to move and advance knowledge. I think the advancement takes place on the notional side. Without apprehension of notions, we should forever pace around one small circle of knowledge. Okay? Perhaps we'd be like animals, imprisoned in sort of the real and our immediate sensory apprehension of the real, but not going beyond it. Without a firm hold on things, we shall waste ourselves in vague speculations. I've already mentioned you know, maybe German idealism as being something contemporary with Kant living in British universities that he might be skeptical about. However, real apprehension has the precedence as being the scope and end and the test of the notion. So between these two, this one has pride of place. Okay. It is, he says again, just here from page 47, it is the scope and the end and the test of the notional. The fuller is the mind's hold upon things or what it considers such, the more fertile it is in its aspects of them and the more practical in its definitions. So our definitional knowledge, our abstract notional knowledge of things should be, it seems, in this uh, relationship to our real apprehension of the same things. I didn't want to go over all of chapter three, but I wanted to cover that because it seems to me that that's going to set us up for understanding real and notional ascent in chapter four, which we'll begin today and finish next time. Okay. Any questions about this or about, about does these kinds of apprehension also come? But Newman is prior to the modernist crisis and all of that, which we'll come later in terms of um, belief. But it seems like when, when, when would you date the modernist crisis? Uh, I guess turn of the century. Okay. And Newman's maybe a couple decades before. Guys in the 1890s. The 90s, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe this is right at the beginning and probably the seeds are already there. Yeah. But it seems like the when when all of this begins to apply to the objects of belief, mm -hmm. it's notional apprehension that is being claimed as actually the more, the thing that we actually need to believe that, that these real things, these, you know, that that Jesus, you know, really died on the cross. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's just that's just the sort of story and image mm -hmm. that that you're given, so that you understand the notional apprehension, right? Which is that God loves you and your sins have been forgiven. You can see a way you can take a sort of Platonic approach to this and yeah. prioritize this one over that one, right? In the sense that what what seems real here is just the sensory mm -hmm. needs to be left behind, and you're moving in the direction maybe of Gnosticism right. overall, saying, well. It's the theologian who really has the really sophisticated definitional apprehension of the truths of faith, who really is, is the best Christian, good Christian. New, this is where I warned you before against people misinterpreting and exploiting his distinction between religion and theology. I think it's going to track the real and the notional here. Theology is going to place on the notional side, and religion, in terms of the real concrete religious practice of the people, is going to put on this side. So we don't want to pry those apart. We don't want to conceive of these separate from each other. We don't want to conceive of theology without religion. We certainly don't want to conceive of religion without theology. Tommy, does that satisfy a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I like okay. you connecting it back to the free Christian thing. I think that's what I'm doing. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think this is what Newman's fighting against. I mean, you can see Newman himself, something of a controversial figure in his own time, and afterwards people have accused him of modernism, people have accused him of being insufficiently attentive to Scholasticism, because he's not actually developing scholasticism, he's giving us, I think, a, a new-ish sort of system and way of thinking about ascent. Um, so we'll look forward. I'm, I'll be certain that we get to the part of the book where we're talking about religion and theology, since that, that's, I think, relatively well known. Um, if he's correct about this, then the theological insight into the abstract truths of the faith needs to always have its, it's going to be tested by the religious sense that conceived of as having you know its proper role right but we'll, we'll have to we'll have to work with that 
want to take a look at that because there are ways of going wrong in the other direction besides of privileging the religious at the expense of the theological. So, and obviously, we want both. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, my for, just to for clarity, my impression was he wasn't value judging this. This is no, so yeah, simply yeah. a psychology of ascent. Right. And he's trying to describe what's going on in your head. Correct. Not unlike what we just read with Willem. So <coughs> trying to describe what's going on. Right, and that, that seems a good way to think of this. This is descriptive. Uh, it's just an element of what we're doing. This is genuinely the test and standard of the notional. If the notional breaks free of it, then something's gone wrong in the psychology of knowledge. Right? People just aren't functioning well. Okay. Any questions about the, the page 47, the end of chapter chapter 3? Let's talk about real real and notional ascent, we've got, maybe we'll only be able to introduce it today uh, in the remaining time. Okay. Let's just begin with this then. Uh, what What is the difference then between real and notional ascent in chapter four? We will continue with this next time. We're talking about ascent by its nature being one and indivisible, etc. We get a lot of examples in here throughout Newman's giving us examples, try to bring to mind exactly what's going on in our different types of apprehension and descent. Um, section two, he says, real apprehension may be pronounced stronger than notional because things, which are its objects, are confessedly more impressive and effective than notions, which are the object of the notional. Experiences in their images strike and occupy the mind as abstractions and their combinations do not. Okay, so again, this distinction here, right? This really relates us to things, to real things. This relates us to notions of things to be tested against the real. Next, passing on to ascent, and let's have page 50 here. Next, passing on to ascent, I observe that it is this variation in the mind's apprehension of an object which to which it ascents and not any incompleteness in the ascent itself that leads us to speak of strong and weak ascents, as if ascent itself had been in the degrees. So what do we have here? We speak of strong and weak ascent, but there is no degree of ascent. Ascent is all or nothing. We got that from before. So why do we speak of that? It's because, he suggests, we perceive this distinction between the real ascent, which is vivid, and the notional ascent, which is more abstract, and how does he describe it? Does not occupy the mind. When the term Hume uses is force and vivacity when he's talking about ideas. But there's just not something so um, exciting and gripping to the mind as the notions of things. One can imagine a world in which all, all religion was theological, was just, just theology, right? Or all history, just dry theology, never getting to the real thing. <coughs> in either mode of apprehension, be it real or notional, the ascent preserves its essential character as unconditional. And he gives more <coughs> examples. So it is unconditional, it is one and indivisible, but it is real as it is related to real things and their apprehension, and it's notional as it's related to notional, to notions, and the apprehension of notions. So and keep in mind again, the real here, it's almost, we might almost want to reverse the order of these things and call this apprehension of real things and apprehensions of notions of things. Right? Because this sounds like these are your adjectives modifying apprehension. It's apprehension is notional in character. Or ascent that is notional in character. He's going to say, no, it is ascent to notions versus ascent to things. Okay. It's going to be important to get. Even the English grammar is going to mislead us because of the way we would just commonly interpret an adjective noun pair like this. Okay. It's not a scent that is notional, it's a scent in the notional mode. Okay. Because its objects are notional. Yeah. Would, would a scent to these be <coughs> almost immediate? Well this this would be immediate in the sense, I guess, that it, it's but he talks also here about not just the experience of the thing, but also the memory of the thing. The memory of the thing is a real ascent. It's a real apprehension. It's just the presence of the thing to us in memory. Or that's something that Hume certainly would kick over to this side and say that's an idea instead of an impression. 
right? Compression is where you're immediately connected by your senses. And you're having this sort of immediate, vivid, un unignorable sensation. So I want to look at his treatment of memory next time, because memory is another mode of real ascent, right? It's not notional, because it's connecting us to the real thing, and to the memory of the thing. So there's a vividness to that that he's going to play up, as opposed to somebody like Hume or an empiricist for whom those things would be mental copies or something like mental.